The Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 6, beginning with verse 25. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor weep nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory would not clothe like one of these. If God so clothes the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what we will wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and Redeemer. Amen. Last week, those who were watching our service from home online met a new soloist, one whose voice raised above all the others in the opening hymn. That soloist did not audition for their place in the choir, and he was uninvited. That soloist was me. I forgot to turn my mic off during the opening hymn. Laurel was at home with Lila, and if only you could scream through the TV and get it to me. As soon as I walked through the door, she told me that my mic was on during that entire first hymn, and so we watched it, and we had a really good laugh. And then we watched it again last night, and we just couldn't stop smiling. Perhaps after hearing this, that may become one of our most watched services. Well, if you were watching from home, I want to assure you that our choir is much better uh, than they sounded last week during that opening hymn. Thank you so much, Andrew and Mary, for understanding. And again, what a privilege to have the children uh, singing with us this morning. I once heard it said that worrying must do a lot of good, because 99% of what we worry about never even happens. Yet worry is real, but Jesus and Paul tell us not to worry. Our two New Testament readings for this morning tell us, do not worry. Matthew says, do not worry about your life, and Paul and Philippians, do not worry about anything. It's an instruction, almost a command, and it's one that I'm sure we would all really like to follow. Not just because Jesus and Paul said it, but because we know it's good for us. Worry penetrates us in a way that might be hard to describe. Sometimes it's a racing heart, a sleepless night, hard and seemingly endless work to do away with that worry that goes nowhere, or perhaps a despairing depression that causes us not to be able to work at all. Worry is dangerous. It impacts our health, and it brings down our quality of life. And I don't want to tell you not to worry, because sometimes it seems that we might have good reason to worry even if it might seem small compared to the problems of others, it's still real to you, and therefore it's important, and it's significant, and should not be easily done away with. Telling someone not to worry is always a difficult task. 
Reading these verses from Matthew and from Paul, one might ask, do Jesus and Paul know the risks and the possible consequences of what we today are facing? Are they aware of recent and ongoing global events? Are they aware of our situations and how our situations may be unique and different than theirs? Do they not see how our situations warrant worry? Can the words of the Bible shape us today? Yes, 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 and yes. One of the very first sermons I ever preached was on this passage from Matthew. During seminary, I was a ministry intern for one summer at Premier Igreja, a Presbyterian church, first church in Fortaleza, Brazil. Fortaleza is the fifth largest city in Brazil located on the northeastern coast. Please do not test me now the way Cesar sometimes does with my previous Spanish ability, but at that time I spoke Portuguese. Not fluently, but well enough to translate for American groups that were doing mission building work in that city. And I preached on this passage. I can't remember, it was in the lectionary or my choosing, but I preach on this passage from Matthew. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Shortly after preaching that sermon and Certainly now, as I look back on that experience, I can't help but think that it was a rather bold passage to preach upon in that context. And I'm actually not sure what I was thinking. That summer, I had a black Lacoste polo shirt. It's in the majority of the photos from that summer and actually for many more years to come. I wore that shirt for about a decade and only recently parted with it. Or maybe a little longer than a decade then. That shirt at that time cost about $65. Today it's probably over $100. I learned that summer that the cost of that shirt was nearly a week's wage for some of the people in the church I was serving. And here I was preaching a sermon to them on not worrying about food, about clothing, about their life. Worry is real, and sometimes it seems very justifiable. There are a lot of people worried right now at this hour. I find it impossible not to pick up the newspaper each morning, especially over the past couple of weeks, and not worry about the well-being of others. In the wake of global events, there is worry about Israelis' family members who have been brutally taken hostage and those who have endured terrorist attacks. There's the worry of innocent people, Palestinians, wanting nothing to do with the terrorism of a week ago who have no place to go. There are legitimate worries in our world and, of course, so many more worries that just move a little further down our newsfeed. Last week, a significant earthquake impacting Afghanistan. Some of these worries might put our worries into place at moment, least momentarily, but that's not to negate your worries. Because when something involves you directly, when you have a worry, no matter what it is, it's difficult to minimize, and I certainly do not want to and do not mean to and will not because I know that there are very worthy worries among us. Concerns about health, safety of loved ones, providing for our families, and they are important too. Paul knows hardship. He's writing his letter to the Philippians from a prison cell awaiting trial in Rome. And even amid his context of difficulty, of challenge, of reason to worry, he instructs the Philippians, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. No matter the circumstance, give thanks to God. 
For as James 1, 17, 18 states, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change or shift like the shifting shadows. Our circumstances and reasons for worry may change, but the character of God does not. Therefore, rejoice in the Lord always. Unlike the shifting shadows, God is steadfast, and yet we have to admit that there are times when it's easier to give thanks to God, moments in which our emotions and our minds and heart align with the truth of what we believe, the truth of what is real, of God's existence. And likewise, unfortunately, there are moments in which our emotions, our hearts and minds are not in line with the truth of God's love. But this misalignment doesn't negate the truth of God's existence and love. It just changes our perception of it. And in this space of misalignment, that is where worry thrives. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines worry as to afflict with mental distress or agitation, to make one anxious. The Cambridge Dictionary defines worry as to think about problems or unpleasant things that might happen in a way that makes you feel unhappy and frightened. But the best definition that I found is in a biblical dictionary, a lexicon, which defines worry as undue stress and anxiety. I like this definition because of the addition of the word undue. Inserting undue differentiates a worthwhile concern from worry. Concern can be productive in that it causes us to prepare and to prevent that which concerns us, whereas worry, undue stress, is unproductive and unnecessary. For example, instead of saying that I study for an exam or I pre prepare for a sermon because I'm worried, I might be better off saying that I am concerned I will not pass a test or do well preaching a sermon, and therefore I prepare. There is a difference between worry and concern. And in light of Scripture, I'm defining worry as undue anxiety. The difference between worrying that is unproductive and that which is productive concern is trust in God. As Psalm 9:10 states, those who know your name, O Lord, trust in you, for you have never forsaken those who seek you. Trust combats worry. Trusting in God requires humility, as 1 Peter 5, 6 through 7 tells us, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Worrying is an act of bravado, of arrogance, thinking more highly of oneself than one ought to think. Worry is the false belief that we are in control and that we make all the difference in our situations or in the concerns of the world. To trust and not to worry is an act of humbling oneself, of knowing that the fate of the world or our own individual fates, fates isn't dependent upon us. It's not to free us from action, and it's not to absolve us from responsibility, but it is to reorder our priorities so that we seek God first, act second, and that by seeking God, we can be strengthened for how and in which way we act. Worrying is forgetfulness about who God is, and it is why God is repeatedly referred to as the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, as we saw in our Old Testament passage. 
at the golden calf, the Israelites forgot what God had done for them. They forgot that it was God who delivered them from Egypt. And in their forgetfulness, they worried. And in their worry, they lost humility, and they tried to solve their worry all on their own in a way that was counter to God. They built a golden calf. They built a false god, an idol, to absolve themselves of worry. We must never let worry lead us to the wrong paths because worry is a very tough and dangerous position from which to make decisions. Paul tells us, do not worry about anything, and he tells us not just to not worry, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving to let your requests be made known to God. Not worrying isn't to be lackadaisical or uninformed, but to be intentional about what we do instead. I'm reminded of Jesus talking about a house, a house that was swept clean of the spirits of negativity that used to dwell there. Jesus gives us this image. When an impure spirit comes out of a person... It goes through arid places, seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left, the one that was swept clean. And when it arrives, it will find the house unoccupied, swept clean, put in order, empty. Then it goes and it takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go and they live there. When Paul and when Jesus tell us not to worry, they're not just telling us don't worry. They're telling us to rejoice and to focus on God. Because if you don't do that, you'll never be successful in not worrying. If you just try not to worry, you create an empty space. And what's left to fill it? But even worse worries. You need to Instead of emptying, replace and kick out, you need to change the pressure in the room by rejoicing, by rejoicing in the Lord. So don't just worry. Pray. Read Scripture. Come to worship. Talk to one of our pastors. Go to the plock party. Sing the hymns. Focus and grow in faith. And then you cannot help but act in love. Again, Paul tells us if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. This isn't to ignore what we worry about, but it is to form and frame ourselves in such a way that we can face it and that we can navigate it. All so much easier said than done. I know no one wants to worry. As Paul says, I do not understand what I do, for what I do I do not want to do, but what I hate to do I do. And that might be worry to us. We don't want to worry, and yet we worry. Sometimes we can't help but to worry. But instead of being consumed by it, let's make the concerted effort not to focus on our worry, but to focus on God. And let us strive to do all we can to rejoice. And to think about God and His saving love displayed throughout the entirety of Scripture. We're about to celebrate communion, and after that I hope you join us at the block party on 73rd Street. And the block party is going to be a lot of fun. We're not doing this to ignore or to escape whatever it is that that worries you. But to be strengthened in the knowledge of the love and grace of God so that we can better navigate that which worries us. Because we're better off knowing the fellowship of others and we're a whole lot better knowing the love of God. Therefore, do not be discouraged. Let us know the love of God, not to run from that which worries you, but to strengthen you to navigate it in the strength and love shown to us on the cross, the love of God, 
In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.